Okay, so we'll get started. And if people join a few minutes late, it shouldn't be too bad. So let me clear the time. And just to remind everyone, this is being recorded. So uh, you'll be able to watch that recording sometime tomorrow when I post it to YouTube. If you have questions, please join the Slack workspace. I have everyone muted, um, so it shouldn't be too chaotic in that regard. And if you have questions, please add them to the Slack. I do have a second monitor, so I will be keeping an eye on it if something is unclear or if I forget to unmute or something like that. Uh, okay. So um, I'm here to talk about how to learn Apache Spark and also just what is Apache Spark as well. Um, so who am I? I'm Joe Kambarakis. I'm a senior technical instructor at Databricks. I was employee number 202, I think. We don't actually have employee numbers, uh, but I joined about three and a half years ago, so quite a while ago. I live in Needham, Massachusetts, and uh, with my family, this is uh, Katina right here, Ben, and my wife, Deb. I also run the Boston Spark Meetup group um, as well. And I've been doing big data education and training and sales for about 10 years now, uh, previously at EMC, Cloudera, and IBM. If anyone has any questions about my background, feel free to ask on the Slack channel. I don't know uh, what kind of questions there would be, uh, but I also have LinkedIn. Um, so if you want to connect with me there and see um, some of my previous jobs, feel free to do that. Um, if you do want to speak at a future meetup or be a sponsor, then uh, please get in touch with me or Tom McGovern, the other organizer. And again, uh, the Slack channel is the best place to reach us there. Uh, it's a little bit odd now without in-person meetups, but we've done a virtual one previously. We'll probably do another one sometime soon as well. Um, you don't really need to do much to sponsor a virtual one, just being a speaker uh, is probably a little bit easier. Uh, but we've had some really great sponsors in the past, um, such as uh, IBM and Databricks and McGraw-Hill, um, uh, a lot of good ones, uh, Warner Brother Games. So if you look at some of the past meetups, we've had some really good sponsors. All right, so I'll begin with a Spark overview, then I'll talk about uh, some resources for learning Spark, and then I'll show you how to create create a notebook, create a cluster, and navigate a um, free uh, learning resource that Databricks has put. But first, we'll begin with an overview. So Apache Spark is an analytics processing engine, and it's really good for big data. You can do small data, and we'll see some examples later where we don't have gigantic petabyte data sets, uh, but it's really meant for uh, large-scale data analytics. Uh, it is definitely the biggest and uh, most contributed to uh, open source project for things such as data processing. And the technology was created by the founders of Databricks as part of their uh, PhD. And you can find, uh, if you want like the white papers and things like that, um, the RDD white paper is very, very good. And you can find it online or just ping me or I can add it to the Slack channel. So why use Spark? Um, so we saw even before, it's open source. So that's always a good sign. There's no uh, billing or licensing associated with using it. Uh, it's also fast, uh, so extremely, extremely fast. Um, has done lots of um, benchmarking with sorting data and those kinds of things. It's fairly easy to use. And this is a little bit subjective. Um, so some people might think it's hard. Some people might think it's easy. but I think overall, compared certainly to a lot of the tools that came before it, such as Pig or Hive or MapReduce, um, very, very easy to use in that regard. And it actually provides a nice unified API. So you get some flexibility on languages. And we'll see that in a moment as well. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to add them to the Slack workspace. And I'll answer them as we go. Um, so the main thing with Spark is the design is meant to be easy. So there are really two big parts to that easy. Um, one is that your code should be very flexible and easy to read. And then the other part should be that it's very high level. Uh, we'll talk about the code part first. Um, so part of being flexible is you could write SQL code and just SQL, 
or you can use a data frame API with things like Python and Scala. Uh, it also should be fairly simple to also do streaming. Uh, you don't have to do streaming, but it's another API. And um, the alternative to this is if you do things in batch. Uh, so this would be batch. So reading one file, reading one directory, and processing it. Where streaming is going to be continuously reading and processing, reading and processing. And then you can also use it for machine learning as well. So roughly the same API for doing three different things, batch processing, streaming, and building machine learning models. The other part of easy is lots of different languages. So you could use R or SQL or Python or Scala or Java. You don't need to learn a domain specific language or a purpose built language. And there's actually another API for Spark that's .NET that Microsoft has created. So if these five language choices aren't enough, there's yet another one. Uh, that said, Python is the most popular by uh, quite a big margin. Uh, but there are a lot of SQL and Scala and Java and R users as well. So you don't have to learn a specific language or tool. You can keep using the language you're already familiar with, such as Python or Scala. So another part of easy to use. So the other part is that it's going to handle a lot of the processing and under the hood kinds of things for you. So you think at a high level with this idea of a Spark application, and maybe it's something like uh, select star from a table. And what Spark will do is take your high level logic, then break it up into smaller jobs. Uh, and then those jobs, it'll break up into stages. And the stages will break up to the lowest level to a task. And this task is going to map to one core. So if you have a machine with 64 cores, you can do 64 tasks at once. So core is, you can think of the hardware, and task is the software. And Spark will do this for you. You just think high level, it'll break it up into jobs and stages and tasks. The key thing with stages is they are separated by shuffles. So if you have to shuffle the data on a cluster, um, then you'll in, add another stage. So we think here, high level, Spark will do the, okay, where is that file located? How many pieces of that file? How do we optimize it based on our hardware? We don't want to start thinking, okay, I've got 16 cores and the data is in this place and I need to move the data from core one to core two, from core one to core three. You'd write the same code, select star from a table. It'll figure out how many cores there are and how to break it up. So you don't have to start writing low level um, message passing uh, interface kind of code. And we'll see some examples of this as well. So we do need a cluster to run things on. So there's two main parts, a driver and a worker. The driver does a few things. The driver talks to us and we talk to the driver. So it's sort of the interface to the cluster. So if we say, hey, select star from this table, we actually send that code to the driver. The driver is then going to distribute it across the workers. So it's going to send the code here. So send code to the workers. It's also going to monitor them. So if it sends code to a worker, it wants to check to make sure that worker is doing it. We don't lose that uh, worker. We don't lose that node. Um, and then when we get a response, it'll return the values to us. So um, return values. If we say, hey, print the first 10 records, it'll send that code to the workers, it'll fetch 10 records, and then print those to our screen. And again, we'll see some examples of that a little bit later. Um, so the nice thing is, we just talk to the driver, and it'll figure out, okay, how many workers there are, and we don't need to know if there's one worker or 100 workers underneath. So it'll handle those kinds of things for us. And again, we don't want to start thinking, all right, what kind of software is on those workers or anything like that? We want to think high level in a SQL engine type of way. Uh, you can have at least one worker and you can have thousands and thousands of workers. There's certainly a lot of um, companies out there that have thousands and thousands of workers processing um, petabytes of data. Within those workers is an executor, and this is just a JVM. 
So all the code that we write, regardless of the APIs, whether it's Python or R or SQL or Scala or Java, all gets turned into Java bytecode for us. So I could show some examples of this, but we'll often write one or two lines of code, and then it turns into very, very verbose hundred lines of Java. Right? So it's going to end up being a lot faster. There's no uh, need to run all these different interpreters on the cluster. Uh, it all ends up running the same way. And again, uh, those workers are going to have some level of processing or cores. So you can think of this as how many threads it can handle, how many tasks it can handle. And again, those tasks, the lowest level code will map to a core. You can think of a task as read a file, a very, very small task. So uh, there's obviously a lot to learn. So I did want to provide a lot of links to different learning resources. Um, there's thankfully a lot of lots of good ones, but really the goal of this talk was to get people the first idea and then how to where to go from here. What's sort of the next step? Uh, we got a lot of requests for uh, from the meetup about topics, and one of them was, oh, just how to get started. Uh, we've certainly had lots of talks about uh, machine learning and advanced tuning and things like that, uh, but we really haven't had a sort of beginner talk, and that was really the goal for this one. So uh, one of the best resources is this book here, Learning Spark Second Edition, and it's written by some of my coworkers, uh, Jules, Brooke, TD, and Denny Lee. It's a really, really good book. It's written on Spark 3.0, uh, which was released in June. So a very, very recent book. And the book also was released in June. Um, so the other thing is there's a link where you can get a free copy of this. So it, I'll show you the link. So Databricks owns the digital rights for one year. So you can get a copy if you put in your name, email, and answer this question. Um, and you'll probably get some marketing emails. Um, but that said, that's not a very expensive thing to do. And it's sort of worth dealing with marketing if you get a free book. Um, I have a copy of it and I can show you what it looks like. And I have read it myself. And so I can recommend it in that regard. So here's the book, a PDF, 400 pages. And it's got um, a lot of really nice code examples in it. There's some notes, uh, there's an introduction, but it covers things like optimization, streaming, data frames. There's also machine learning examples, data lake examples. Um, there's also um, lots of sort of tips at the end. So very, very good book um, to read and pretty good considering all you'll need to do is really just get some marketing emails from uh, Databricks. So really nice free resource there. Um, what I would also say is don't read Learning Spark 1. Uh, I read that book. It was written about five years ago and is very, very outdated. So in case you find that book, uh, don't read it. It's a good book and was a really good book for the time, uh, but it's very, very old, uh, uses a totally different API for Spark. Uh, so make sure you, uh, you get something that's on Spark 2 or on 3.0 ideally. So that's one really good book that I can recommend. There's also the Spark Definitive Guide, which was written by Bill Chambers and Matei Zaharia. Matei is the original creator of Spark. Uh, this book's a little bit older, uh, but still covers a, in a little bit more depth some uh, more machine learning topics. Um, not as good for beginners, but still a good book, I would say. Uh, and I do look at it occasionally. So another good book. And there's a link. Uh, you can find it. It's just another O'Reilly book there. There's also Spark Summit. Uh, so uh, this um, next month, it will also be called Data and AI Summit. This is a twice a year conference for Spark Talks. And it also covers things such as uh, artificial intelligence and data engineering, those kinds of topics. There's lots of different companies that do speak. Uh, they just announced some of the keynote speakers. Uh, I think it was like Malcolm Gladwell is the one that jumped out to me, but it's virtual. And it's free. Um, so again, uh, no cost to attend. Uh, you do have to put your email in and get emails from marketing and things like that. But again, very, very small price to pay for uh, getting to see a lot of talks. You can talk to other people. There's a, the interface that they use 
uh, the virtual interface does allow chatting, and you can even get t-shirts and things like that as well. Uh, so a really, really nice conference. The one in June, uh, Spark Summit US, was really, really nice. Um, and there's lots of keynotes, lots of different tracks, uh, different talks. Um, and I attended that one uh, as well. And I'll be attending this one. So free cost um, event. Uh, so definitely check it out. And there'll actually be free training at it. I believe there'll be a free training on Delta Lake there. Um, so definitely check out the webpage for that. So another really good learning resource. Um, now, what about previous Spark Summits that obviously we can't uh, go back to June and attend those. So one thing that Databricks does is all the talks do get put online. Um, so there's a link to the talk here or to this webpage, but basically there's over 1700 different talks about different Spark topics. Uh, you can filter by speaker, you can filter by category, you can look at the particular event. Uh, but this is one about what are the new Spark 3.0 features, for example. Um, so all the videos and talks do get uh, archived. There's no fee to access them or anything like that. And if you take a look, there are lots and lots and lots of different talks. Uh, and a lot of people have the Spark and AI Summit virtual background. Um, I can't say I've seen every single one of the 1,700 talks, but uh, I've worked with some of these companies, such as Previsera, and they're really great. Uh, Dean is really good. I, um, he's not at any scale anymore. He just went to Domino. Uh, but I know Dean personally, and he's really um, great, one of uh, expert in Scala. And there's really just tons and tons of talks, um, people from Facebook and Zillow. So really, really great learning resource. Um, and I often watch uh, these videos if there's things I'm not too sure about. So a really nice resource there as well. And again, these slides are on the Slack workspace. So if you need the link, uh, it's right there. Shouldn't be too hard to find Spark Summit Video Archive, but the talks, uh, I can show that quickly. And the sample notebook that uh, I'll use later are right there. So you don't have to worry about taking screenshots or anything like that. And if you do have a comment or question, feel free to add it. I see someone uh, there. And again, the recording I'll put up uh, sometime later. So another really good resource for learning as well. Another couple resources are these two blogs. So Jacek is an instructor in Poland, and he has this really great blog where he talks about uh, all different things about the internals, the Spark, and it's all on GitHub. Uh, or get book. Um, maybe that's the link, but um, maybe he moved it. Uh, but lots of good talks there. Um, and it's this book, Internals of Spark. So you can see all the different things here on memory and network, lots and lots of different topics. So I often uh, will look at this blog as well. He's also really good on Twitter. He posts a lot of things there. So that's one good resource. And then the Databricks blog usually gets updated every day. Uh, let's see. So October 21st, so that's today. Uh, this one talks about SQL and adaptive query execution. Uh, and this is just the engineering blog. There's probably other ones. Uh, the machine learning blog, for example, updated yesterday. Uh, and then this one, the 19th. So quite a lot of updates and resources there as well. And again, I do refer back to some of those talks. And sometimes I steal pictures from those talks as well. Um, so those are definitely the two best uh, blogs that I've seen. So how do you start coding? Uh, there's a free version of Databricks called Community Edition. Um, so you, again, you'll have to put in your email and get marketing uh, emails. But again, pretty small price to pay for access to a free platform. So I have the link there. But if you just search for Community Edition, you should be able to find it. And let me show what that looks like. Uh, so it's this link. You put in your name and email, and you sign up. And you can actually opt out of the emails. And then they'll send you an email. And I can show you what that looks like. I did try it again today. It says, welcome to Databricks Community Edition. You'll need to verify your email. And you can go to this link. And it will take you to this. So this is an account I created. So just my email, Joseph K uh, plus meetup at Databricks. And it's a free platform for running Spark code. 
So you don't have to do all the kind of networking and set up a cluster and those kinds of things. Uh, my background is more in data science. I don't know the first thing about configuring VMs or Docker or uh, containers or deploying software on a cluster. But this provides a nice UI and a notebook-like interface that I can work with. Um, and this is what I use at work and what most of our customers use. There's a couple other features as well. Uh, but if you're just learning, if you're beginning, this is a perfect resource to get started with. So I'll talk a little bit about the platform, show you the buttons, um, and I'll step you through a sample notebook. And then combined with those books, especially the free book Learning Spark, uh, you'll definitely be able to start coding up some notebooks and examples uh, on your own. And the book does have, um, it says using coding examples, um, and there's instructions here about how to get um, all of the notebooks and things like that. Uh, and I'll show some other parts uh, as well. Okay, so that is the free platform community edition. So what does it have? Um, at, on the left, we have a few buttons. So there's a landing page button here, and that takes you to just this landing page. It says, welcome to Databricks. There's a home button, and this will show your users. So here's me, I'm the only user in this workspace. There's my email, and then I have a sample notebook. And you can do things like export your work so you're not tied into the platform. You can create notebooks and folders and libraries. You can import notebooks. So that notebook that I shared on the Slack workspace, you can import and try in your own. Uh, and you can also get it out, out of the platform. Um, this button here is just for workspace, which is just right here. Not the most useful button, um, especially since you can sort of access it from home. Then any recent notebooks will show up here. If you create a database, it'll show up in this data button. And there's a way to create a cluster. So I'll walk you through creating a cluster. And again, uh, the ideas behind Spark are to make things easy. So we tried to make creating a cluster fairly easy. So there's a blue button here for create cluster. And I got to give it a name, so I'll call it meetup. Then you pick what version of Databricks you want to use. So it looks like there's 7.4 beta and 7.3, and one with GPUs and one for machine learning. So lots of different versions here. It's important to use Spark 3, since that's the newest release. Uh, and I'll just pick the 7.3 long-term support version. Uh, the not huge differences version to version, um, at least with the major releases. And then all you really need to do after that is click Create Cluster. It'll take a few moments to spin up this cluster, um, but we now have some cloud resources to run the code in our notebooks. In the cluster, you can see, all right, what notebooks are attached, what libraries have we attached, the event log. Well, so far only creating. There's a user interface, which isn't there yet. There's driver logs, but again, we don't really, haven't run anything. There's metrics, um, again, still hasn't started, so no metrics yet. Uh, we can't schedule any jobs since it is the free version and it's not really what you'd be doing um, as a beginner either. But what we can do is uh, look back at our home page, and we see there's ways to create a new notebook or create a table. We've already created a new cluster. There's also ways to create MLflow experiments and links to documentation. And the documentation is actually really important, and I'll show that in a moment as well. So we can create a new notebook, and you have to give it a name. So I'll call it a Meetup Example. You pick a language, so you can pick Python, Scala, SQL, or R. I'll just pick Python and then what cluster we want to attach it to. So I'll attach it to the one I just created. And it looks like it's green, so it is available. And now I can start writing some code. So I can do Python code, x equals 10. And then it's a cell-based notebook interface. So if you're familiar with Jupyter, very, very similar to Jupyter. So I can create a variable, and then I can run the cell. There's other buttons up here. Um, there is the clusters, so only one attached cluster. 
I can make a new notebook, I can copy or rename or move or delete the notebook or export it in all different kinds of formats. Uh, I can cut cells or add cells. I can make a dashboard. There's a run all button. I can clear things. There's hotkeys, and I don't really know any of the hotkeys. Um, there's ways to publish the notebook. You can add in comments. If you're running experiments with MLflow, that's there. The notebooks do save automatically. So if you click on this little time icon, it'll show you the notebooks uh, versions. So we can add new cells. If you hover over the middle, there's a little plus button. But when you run code, like creating this variable here, it tells you how long it took, who ran it, what time, and on what cluster. So there is a little bit of sort of meta notebook information. So really great sort of notebook interface for running Spark code or even just plain Python code. I've heard some examples of people using this just to write Python code. So if you don't want to install Python locally, which is usually a big headache, uh, you can use this to just run Python code or SQL code or um, Scala code as well. So a really great free tool um, there. So that's community edition. And the other thing is you do want to have the Spark documentation open as well so that you can follow along and refer back to it. And this is something that I do even though I've been using Spark for about five years now. Um, so I have that link open right here. In this case, the Spark um, SQL, uh, sorry, the Python documentation. So you can see there's lots of it here, um, but you can also search for things as well. The last thing I want to show is how to load in a notebook. Um, so I did share that sample notebook. I'll show you how to load it in. and I'll take a couple pictures and then I'll walk through that sample notebook. And that should act as a really good uh, starting point for running the notebooks and practicing. So you'll click home, then the arrow and import. So let me draw a couple boxes here. Home, arrow, import, and oh, import. So that's going to be the first step. So if we click import, we then have this user interface. So we can drag and drop a file. We could use a URL. And we have lots of different file formats that we can upload. DBC just stands for Databricks Cloud. And it's really just a zip. Um, you can also just load in source files like Scala, Python, SQL, R, R Markdown, IPython. So I'm going to take that sample notebook that I shared on the Slack workspace. I'm just going to drag and drop it in. And then I get a green check. Let me write. I'll take a screenshot for everyone. And I'll put those pictures up a little bit later. And I'll click Import. So that's a copy of the notebook I created earlier, but just called Sample. So let's take a look at Sample. And I'll attach it to my cluster. Uh, so I have some notes here, and I also have some code. Um, so make sure you attach to the cluster. You need something for the compute piece. In the notebooks, you can also change languages. So we see that this is a Python notebook, but we could run SQL queries. So here I have this query in SQL, show tables. So you just need to use the percent sign and then the language. So percent SQL, show tables. Well, I haven't created any table. So this will just say, OK. And if we look at the data button, here's our default database, and there's no tables. So that makes sense. If I want to write some Python code, I can create a variable here, a string message, and then I can print it out. And there's my printout. If I wanted to make some R or write some R code, I can do percent %r and make a plot. So there is TWA international flights over time. And I can actually write Scala code as well.
And here we have this message. Uh, Spark is written originally in Scala. Some, another really important notebook command is whose. And whose will show you all the variables that are in the notebook. So if we look, we see there's some utilities and that message variable we created earlier. And the most important one is this Spark session object. So it's pre-created for us. And it's how you tell the language you're using, whether it's Python or Scala, hey, stop being Python or Scala, start being distributed Spark code. So we can see that it's a Spark session object if we print it out and we see, yep, it's definitely a Spark session object. But what is that? So if we look at our documentation and search for Spark session, so right here, it tells us it's the entry point to programming Spark with the data set and data frame API. And we can use it to create data frames, register data frames as tables, write SQL queries, cache tables, read parquet files, really everything that you'd want to do. Um, you can create it on your own, and we see the code here for that, um, but pre-created for us. From there, all the methods are listed below. So we have builder and enable hive support, get or create, create a data frame, Lots of different methods. The most important one though is read. And read returns a data frame reader. And let's see what data frame reader does. It loads in a data frame from an external storage system, like a file system. So we could do CSV. So a very, very common uh, thing to do in Spark is spark.read.csv. And then you can read a CSV file. I have an example of that. One thing that you can do in the notebooks though, is print out the documentation within. So if you just do help of Spark, it'll say help there. And it's the entry point to program with Spark with the data frame API. So you have access to all of that stuff within the notebook, just doing help. So the one thing that we wanna look at is read. So if we do help of spark.read, this will tell us, hey, data frame reader to read file systems. And here's that exact documentation that we see right here. So we need some files to read. Thankfully, we don't have to learn right away how to load in files. There are some built into community edition. So if you just do the magic command for file system, and then ls Databricks data sets, there's built in data sets. So there's ones on COVID and uh, airlines and Amazon and lots and lots of different ones there. And I don't know all of them. I do know a few of them. But one really nice thing is there's one on learning Spark version two. So if you get that book, you can go look at all the data sets for that book. So the book will say, oh, in this example, we're going to use the blogs. And so that's right there. And there's a readme here. We can take a look at that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff here. Let's try this one. FS, and we can do a head of a file. And it tells us Spark is a unified engine for large scale processing. This looks a lot like our slides from earlier. Um, there's the documentation how to build it, and this looks like the web page. So built-in data sets, which is really, really helpful for learning. So the one data set I wanted to show an example of is this one here. Um, if we go back up, there is one called wine quality, and that sort of jumped out at me. Uh, my sister is a sommelier and works in a vineyard, so I thought this would be a nice one to look at. So there's a data set wine quality. So we can look at this directory. There's a readme. And it looks like there's this two CSVs, one for red and one for white wine. So let's look at this readme. So it comes from University of California, Irvine. 
and it's Portuguese Vino Verde wine. Uh, looks like from about 10 years ago. It's licensed. Yeah. All right. So it's some wine data. So let's try reading it. Spark.read.csv, and we just give it that path right there as a string. So again, Spark session, read is going to read from a file system, and it's a CSV file. So we use CSV. If you wanted to read a Parquet file, spark.read.parquet would be the code. If you want to read JSON, spark.read.json. So let's read this one. Again, if you do have any questions, feel free to add them to the Slack workspace. Okay, so we read it and it doesn't look good. We have a string. So not too helpful. We can see what's happening under the hood in the UI and we see well, it's, what's going on here. So there's links to the UI and we get some more information. So this is details for job zero. And we have some weird job group, some pool. And it says, yeah, we read a CSV. Got time. It took two seconds. All right. Not great. So it turns out we do need to give some more information to the CSV reader. And if we look at the file, we see, well, it looks like it has a header. And it's not comma separated. It looks, uh, what's that? colon separated, or semicolon separated. So we're going to have to provide some better instructions for reading this file. And if we look back at our documentation, we just did the path argument. But we can provide lots of different arguments. Is there a schema? Is there a separator? And again, the default is comma. What's the encoding? Is there quotes? Are there any escape characters? Is there a header? Yep, there was definitely a header. Do we want to infer the schema, enforce the schema? What do we want to do about white space or nulls? All these different kinds of ways to read a CSV. So we're definitely going to want a header, and we're going to want to change the separator. And the schema, eh, I don't want to figure out the schema. So what you can do is say, there is a header. Header is true. And infer schema, it will just figure out the schema from the underlying values here. And then the separator is that semicolon. So if we run this, all right, pretty quick, two seconds. And now we have a data frame that looks good. Fixed acidity is a double. Volatile acidity, a double. Looks like mostly doubles. And then quality is an integer. So we've got a data frame now. And it has a schema. And that's a really important part of a data frame is that there is a schema associated with it. Um, the rows don't have numbers or anything like that. The columns don't have numbers, but the columns do have two things, a name and a data type. So now that we have this data frame, what can we do with it? Well, we could print it out. There's a command called show that just prints out the data frame. And there we see there's our header and the values, kind of like a terminal output, not very good. Um, there's a better way to do this. There's a function called display. And display is going to do an HTML printout of it. So there we see. All right, this looks a little easier to read. I can scroll over. Um, there's different alcohol levels and quality different things, different values in this data set. We can get summary statistics by just doing summary on the data, and then we can print them out with display. So let's see what those summary statistics are. OK, fixed acidity. There's about 1,600 values. This is the mean, the standard deviation, the min, the quartiles. Apparently, one is very acidic um, there with 15.9% uh, acidity. And then we can see some are very sugary or sweet. And well, maybe alcohol, 15% well, is pretty high. Um, and then the min of 8.4%. So how do you know what you can do with a data frame? So if we go back to our documentation, 
we say, okay, here's the link for a data frame. And a data frame is a distributed collection of rows grouped into columns. Then all the data frame methods are listed. Aggregate, alias, proximate quantile. The one I did earlier was show. So if we scroll all the way down, we'll find show and summary. But there's quite a few of them. Okay, here's show. Prints the first n rows, 20 rows. Summary. Uh, subtract summary, compute statistics. So almost all the operations are going to be listed here, and they're pretty cleanly named. If you need to do a filter, it's called filter. If you need to do a sort, it's called sort. Order by is order by. Underneath Spark is a SQL engine. So if you can think in terms of SQL, then you're already about halfway there. You can do group by, sorting, uh, filtering, add new columns, select, drop, join. All of those are built-in methods. So do you need to keep running the same chunk of code? No, you can more, and what's more common is to just create a data frame, in this case, df. That's the result of that read. So here's df. We see it's a PySpark data frame, and that's our schema. We can also, there is tab completion. So if we do df.tab, then we'll see all those different methods. So if we want, let's say first, for example, and we don't know what first does, we can use help again. And help will tell us, okay, on first, and the row can be accessible. Not too much, it returns a row um, there. So what is, let's run this with, if we just do D, oh, we do need to finish our brackets. So here is the help on first. Turns the first row. Not too interesting. So let's run it again. df.first. There's our first row. Fixed acidity and so on. We can also print out that data frame, just like we did above. And we could do show on it. Well, what if we want to write SQL? If you're more comfortable with SQL, we can turn it into a temp view. There's a method, just create temp view, and you give it a name. And now, if we do show tables, here's our temp table, red wine, and it's temporary. Then we can write SQL. Select star from red wine. There's our table. If we want to do a filter, if you don't like very alcoholic wines, so select star from red wine where alcohol is less than 12. There's our results. Let's check the alcohol column, make sure it worked. Yep, 11.9, so just under 12. And you can actually write the same exact thing using the data frame API. So df where alcohol is less than 12. And this will actually give us the same result and under the hood, there's that Java execution engine, uh, and it actually turns it into the same code. So if you want to ever see what is it doing underneath, well, you can do, let me grab this. Just like in SQL, you can get an explain plan. So there's explain, and you can do mode is code gen. And we'll see what Spark's doing under the hood. So we scan a CSV, then we filter it where alcohol is less than 12 and we return a schema. And here's that Java code that it creates. Here's line one and it's 143 lines of Java. And all we did was spark.read.csv where alcohol is less than 12. So that got turned into all of this bytecode um, or all this Java. If you want, you can write this Java. I can't imagine anyone would when it only takes just about you know, a couple minutes to write that code. So those are the examples I wanted to show. So you have a sample notebook and some resources there. And I think that was all I had for slides. So the big takeaways are um, use community edition, free resource, easy to create a cluster, create notebooks, um, there's also lots of data sets uh, built into it. 
you can read those blogs, look at Spark Summit videos, read the documentation, and that should be a really good beginning for getting started with things. Um, that was all I wanted to cover. So if anyone has any questions, uh, please, um, you can ask now. I'll stick around for a few minutes. You can add them to the uh, workspace. So it is, uh, I can show it right here. So we'll see if any come in. So this is the Boston Apache Spark user group Slack channel and the virtual meetup. So I posted the slides and that sample notebook there. And the slides do have links to all the books and community edition as well. And I'll upload those pictures I took on how to load in the notebook. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to add them there. Um, I guess if you add them to the Zoom chat, it won't be too bad either. Um, but I've muted people. Let's see, I'll unmute people. Let's see how this goes. Um, so you now can unmute yourselves if you wanna unmute and ask a question, I'll answer it as well. Um, otherwise, I will uh, post a recording sometime tomorrow on YouTube and I'll share the link with everyone. Um, but let me know if you have any questions. Hey, Joe. Uh, uh, I don't have any questions, but this is really very good. So, okay. Thanks. And thanks for. No problem. Oh, Mark asks a good question. Is there a way to run PyTorch training in a distributed way on Spark? Yes. Um, so I'll find some documentation around it what you can do is use Spark to be sort of the cluster orchestrator. Um, you can certainly use it to clean and prepare all the data sets, uh, but you can also use it to um, manage that kind of distributed workload. I'll definitely find some documentation on that. Um, actually, let's do it now. Uh, my, normally what I just do is I just do PyTorch on Spark. And then I know that we have an implementation um, so we can take a look at our docs. So uh, there's nice integration. And one thing is with the machine learning runtime, it's actually pre-installed in the cluster. So you don't have to worry about installing it. And it looks like there's a good sample notebook here. Um, let's see. I'll open it. I actually can copy it. And, ah, let's copy it and import it. We'll see what happens. So import URL, that PySpark, PyTorch notebook. Okay, so that looks pretty good. And let me share this link first before I forget. Oh, and let me... Okay, so let's check out this notebook. Uh, so, See, there's some widgets. We're not going to use a GPU. Let's do it. Okay, let's attach. So this is going to ask, use GPU. We don't want to use a GPU here uh, because we don't have one. Databricks is community edition is pretty good, not free GPUs. Um, it looks like we're going to import some libraries, and oh, we probably need the machine learning runtime for this. Um, so uh, looks like it uses MNIST. We've got a directory there for MNIST. Does it import it? Maybe. Um, and then we have to prep it, build a model. So this looks like, yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, and this might be single node is my guess. Uh, but there are ways to do the distributed machine learning. And I don't know if the docs have more. Uh, hmm. 
Uh, maybe it's, it's, it should be. Uh, I think if there's, I know more about uh, TensorFlow, uh, but it looks like it will work. Um, again, having GPUs will make things better. Um, the way that Databricks does the distributed machine learning is through uh, Horovod as a um, orchestrator for that kind of thing. And I'll definitely follow up on that uh, a little bit more, Mark. But that was a good question. Uh, let me make a note to remind myself to follow up on it. And another thing I would check, let's look at those Spark Summit videos. Let's see if we can find a video on PyTorch. So this will be deep learning. Okay. PyTorch. Okay. So there is an example of PyTorch there. And there's me, yeah. So this might be a good talk. I'll share that link too. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? You're welcome to unmute um, if you like. Okay. So I'll stick around for a few more minutes if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, um, feel free to log off and hopefully you can download those slides and get started. So just uh, uh, Joseph, great talk by okay. the way. So, um, so just to follow up on the, uh, on the machine learning piece. So, and so also for inference, it will actually, there's a way to run it on Databricks. Mm -hmm. And eventually we just farm it out to, you know, X number of, you know, cluster instance, I mean, cluster VMs or cluster yeah. solutions. Um, so I can tell you more about how TensorFlow works because that's more of what I've used. Um, so uh, once you get into multiple nodes, you tell Horovode, okay, um, this is how many nodes I have. And it's not, I don't believe, it's been a little while since I looked at it, that'll figure out how many nodes you have. But if you just say, okay, I have six nodes, and then um, you sort of pass that in as an additional training parameter. Okay. Uh, but yeah, for the model building, uh, the inference and in the model evaluation is pretty quick because that's just sort of a big substitution problem. Uh, but I'll find um, at least one other thing about it. Um, but I know for sure that TensorFlow works. The big change that you would need to make is oh, this many. Um, when you create a cluster, if I can turn this one off, it's going to be a different image. But if you do the uh, ML, uh, we don't want GPU. But this one is going to have ML going to. And there's good notes around it. I think they were hinted at. Ah. So the ML runtime, there's a list of all the additional libraries it has. So it's mostly like Keras and PyTorch. Uh, so let's see. So PyTorch 1.6, TensorFlow 2.3. So those are all there, as well as some other libraries. And it's going to use Horobode, I believe, but then there's PyTorch. I think this is just that page earlier. Um, so is that similar to the ML lib, Spark ML lib piece? Or so, is that no, that's a slightly different one. The ML lib is different algorithms. Um, can actually find it if we go back in the docs. Um, it's got more traditional machine learning algorithms, random forest, decision trees, um, and uh, what else? clustering, collaborative filtering, pattern matching. So it's more, I would say, pre-deep learning stuff. 
Um, there's like naive Bayes and lots of regressions. Um, this stuff's all distributed, works really, really well. Um, and, but it's not, uh, the sort of next level for the deep learning stuff is there's not like a deep learning library or algo here. You'd have to still use PyTorch or TensorFlow, or I guess Keras, you wouldn't really use TensorFlow per se. This has lots of uh, cleaning things too. There's different ways to transform the data if you need to do uh, sort of text cleaning up or PCA scaling, those kinds of things are built in. Is that pretty much the, the scikit-learn or is that pretty much the secular library there or? It's very similar. Um, I'm not, I actually went personally from R straight to Spark. So I actually skipped over a lot of the Python things, but my guess is that it's very similar to sklearn and those kinds of um, helper functions and features. Uh, but again, it will be distributed. So if you have a hundred nodes, you do a linear regression and you just say, uh, linear model dot train on your training set. You don't have to do any of the distributed math stuff. And the same for the PyTor for the PyTorch and TensorFlow, same thing pretty much. Yeah, I think there's a couple things you need to tweak with Horovode, but it's pretty painless. Um, and I'll try to find a better example um, of it. Um, trying to think if there's any, there's Petastorm, which I um, will read the Parquet files directly. And I know that's pretty widely used. And I think that's also out of Uber. That project, Petastorm. Yeah. So this lets you read Parquet files for deep learning. I don't know if it, uh, yeah, looks like there's PyTorch. So that is also installed. But yeah, I'll follow up more on the PyTorch and the specific implementation. Anyone else have a question? Okay, well, if you have questions in the future, you can always find me on the Slack workspace. Um, my email is Joseph K at Databricks. And I think it's also in the meetup page as well. All right, I'm gonna turn the recording off and stick around for a few more minutes if you do have any questions. Otherwise, thanks for attending and have a good night.